Mini PCs are no longer the realm of underpowered thin clients and Intel NUCs. AMD's latest APUs can cram an incredible amount of performance into a PC the size of an old Android TV box. But what can they actually do with all that power? Until now, I've never accepted review samples. Most of the stuff I get offered isn't relevant to my channel, or looks sketchy as hell. I'm always fascinated by mini PCs, however, especially those with the chops to handle gaming. So when B-Link offered to send me the new Seer 7 to review, I said, yeah, all right. The Seer 7, which I think that's how you say it. I don't know, I'm making this pronunciation up as I go. The Seer 7 holds a pretty insane 8 core 16 thread Ryzen 7 7840HS with a rated TDP of up to 54 watts. It has a base clock of 3.8 GHz and on paper it can clock up to 5.1, but I'm expecting it to throttle back in longer CPU heavy workloads. The 7840HS is a Zen 4 based Ryzen APU with Radeon 780M graphics on board. This RDNA 3 based iGPU has 12 compute units with a max clock of 2.7GHz and can address up to 16GB of the included 32GB of DDR5 system RAM as a video memory. My particular unit was loaded up with two 16GB sticks of DDR5 5600, though it can support up to 64GB and thankfully both sticks are user replaceable. Zen 4 CPUs on the desktop side of things work optimally with 6000 speed RAM, which would also be of benefit to the integrated 780M graphics, but I couldn't find any faster SODIMs for sale at the time of testing. It's also possible to upgrade the storage. Mine came with a 1TB crucial Gen 4 NVMe SSD, but it also has a second slot on board that is much more accessible. According to the specs, it only supports up to two terabyte drives, and I don't have anything larger than that to hand in order to test if B-Link are understating its capabilities. You are definitely limited to Gen 4 speeds, however, as the CPU itself doesn't support Gen 5 SSDs. For connectivity, we have a pair of USB 4 Type-C ports round back, along with a pair of USB 2 Type-A's, an HDMI 2.1 port and DisplayPort 1.4, and a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port. Meanwhile, up front we have another USB Type-C and a 3.2 Type-A hole, as well as a clear CMOS and a good old fashioned power button. Rounding things up, for wireless connectivity there's onboard Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2, which is better than 5.1 because um, you get an extra subwoofer. Oh, and one more thing. While the Seer 7 can be powered over USB Type-C with a PD3 enabled adapter, the supplied power cable connects magnetically in the style of Apple's MagSafe. You'll have hours of fun plugging and unplugging this, but as for practicality, I don't know. There's no battery backup, so if someone trips on the cable and yanks it out, the PC might not go flying, but you will lose whatever you are doing, so... Practice safe cable management, okay? By the way, while I've torn this unit down to show you the heatsink, you don't need to go anywhere near this far to reach the RAM and SSD to change them, and unless you need to change the CMOS battery or thermal paste, you probably shouldn't, as there's a flex ribbon cable, some very short fan connector cables, and a whole mess of different screws of different sizes and lengths to keep track of. I don't believe in taking it easy on hardware, so most of the games I've tested on the Seer 7 are pretty demanding, starting with The Last of Us. This one's a bit of a VRAM hog, and the default settings only allocate 4GB to VRAM, so even as high, the textures look a bit iffy. That being said, with FSRQ upscaling from 720p to 1080p, the game can maintain an average of 30fps, and, at least in my testing, it's pretty consistent, only dropping into the high 20s. Dropping the quality preset to medium lifts averages to almost 38 FPS and keeps the 1% above 30. I've been recording the same benchmark run in Cyberpunk 2077 for a couple of years now. It's a bit more demanding than the built-in one and covers a mix of driving and walking. If you lower your expectations somewhat, this can be both remarkably playable and good looking. At full 1080p, it's possible to maintain a 38fps average at low settings, but there are the occasional streaming issues that can make things look less than preem. 
Using FSR 2, the high preset gives a 32 FPS average, but lows of 14 make things a bit tough to play. I'd say the best balance is medium with FSR Q. This allows for 40 FPS on average, but with fewer of the oddities seen at the low presets. 2023 titles are all pretty demanding. The PC couldn't even start Starfield, but Ratchet & Clank worked remarkably well. Again, using FSRQ to drop the render resolution, it's possible to play the game at 33 FPS at high settings, though it's not going to be the smoothest ride. Lows drop as far as 22 FPS, and although the SSD is relatively fast, there's still a little stutter in some of the game's scene transitions. At 1080p, using the balanced preset, Resident Evil 4 doesn't really need any upscaling to give a playable frame rate either. It can manage to run at about 40 FPS on average, with lows of about 30. Point ones will be a fair amount lower, but mainly due to the occasional stutter when loading in new data. Forza Horizon 5 is always a pleasant antidote to all the super demanding titles in recent years, and the 7840HS has absolutely no issues running at 1080p, 60fps, high settings, without upscaling. I did have to drop temporal anti-aliasing however, the built-in benchmark fell below 57 with it enabled, and while that only represented the most demanding sections of the game, it's better to be safe than sorry. With FXAA the average hit 62 FPS, and as dropping AA altogether only nets about one extra frame per second, it's probably the best possible compromise. Ordinarily, with integrated graphics, I'd run Fortnite in performance mode to really take the weight off. There's no need with the 780M though, as it was more than able to handle DX12. At 1080 competitive settings I got almost through a full match, I came in fourth, with an average of 96 FPS. Although Fortnite can be stuttery, especially in DX12 and shortly after first booting the game, it still managed to keep 1% lows above 60 FPS. If you're thinking of turning up quality, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but at medium with 100% resolution scaling and epic view distance, the average drops to about 74 and lows dip below 60. Finally, for my dedicated CPU tests, I like to include Civ 6's AI benchmark, partly as something for the strategy fans out there and partly as a benchmark that isn't prejudiced against older chips. Average turn time on the 7840HS is 7.75 seconds, which is actually pretty unimpressive. It's slightly faster than an old i5-2500K at 4.5GHz, and over a second slower than a desktop Ryzen 7 4700G. Now that we're well and truly past the fun stuff, I decided to do a couple more serious benchmarks. I've never used a Blender before, so I don't know if I'm doing this right, but I just downloaded the classroom scene and hit render. As the software didn't seem to be able to use the GPU, I was limited to using the CPU, which completed the test scene in 5 minutes 52.66 seconds. I also found a Blender benchmark app, which is a bit quicker and gives a numbered score, <laughs> though it's a really, really long one. The monster scene scored 99.917695, the junk shop scored 65.935641, and the classroom scored 52.252541. Moving on to something more in my wheelhouse, I did a few quick tests in video editor DaVinci Resolve Studio, using a 5 minute sequence of H.265 clips from my Fujifilm X-T3 camera. These 4K 60fps files recorded with long gop and with a LUT and small curve adjustment applied play back beautifully on the timeline, and scrubbing through has impressively little lag. Trying to make five clips into a split-screen effect with some text and transitions does cause things to collapse somewhat, but that's a torture test even for some much more powerful machines. I tested out rendering to H.264, which completed in 8 minutes 58 on the GPU and 10 minutes 54 on the CPU. Rendering to H.265 works on the GPU and that completed in 8 minutes 50. Finally, I ran through a bunch of synthetic tests on both the CPU and GPU, the results from which are on screen now. So that's pretty much how the Seer 7 performs out the box. However, there is a little room to mess with the settings to stretch this APU even further. 
As I said earlier, the VRAM allocation can be increased as high as 16 gigabytes, though out of caution I decided to stick with 8 for the time being. Also, though it's not particularly well signposted in the BIOS, there is a way of squeezing a little more performance out of the 7840HS. This setting in the menu allows changing the power profile from balanced to performance, boosting the TDP from 54 watts to 65. This should allow for longer boost periods and less power throttling. Of course, that comes with increased temps and power consumption. To see how much, I ran through all the tests again with the tweaks applied. With the higher TDP and VRAM limits in place, the C7 ran The Last of Us at about 36 FPS at medium and 32 FPS at high. These are within margin of error from the stock results, but more than that, I found there were actually slightly more streaming issues at the higher performance setting. This may be related to the reason why the game only recognises 6GB of VRAM too. Cyberpunk however gains a massive boost from the higher limits, gaining about 10% at both medium and high, and with much improved frame pacing for a far more enjoyable gameplay experience. Meanwhile, Ratchet & Clank's gains are, again, within margin of error. Averages gain a couple of FPS, but lows only increase by a single frame. RE4 Remake actually loses performance by about as much as Cyberpunk gains. Almost 10% is dropped from both the average and 1% lows, and there are much more substantial frame time spikes while loading, including this jump scare. Forza Horizon 5's performance doesn't gain much either, only improving by a frame or so, and isn't quite enough to allow for TAA at 60fps. Fortnite gains some performance but only a small amount, it's less than 10% at low and less than 5% at medium. Civ 6's turn times drop from 7.75 to 7.41 seconds, bringing it in line with a near decade old 10 core Xeon. The productivity and synthetic benchmarks are all something of a mixed bag too, but I think my conclusion is that you'll need to do your own testing of the 65 watt profile to see if it's worthwhile for your particular use case, because clearly it has as much chance of hurting performance as helping. For a compact PC that offers this kind of performance then, you'd probably expect some compromises in terms of heat, noise or power consumption. Well, to the latter point first, at idle the CS7 draws about 10 watts from the wall and about 30 to 40 watts during web browsing and watching YouTube. During testing, the highest draw I saw was 95 watts, which occurred both while gaming and during a CPU render in DaVinci Resolve. CPU benchmarks only drew about 83 watts, and GPU stress test combustor pulled 77.5, or 90 watts with the CPU burner running at the same time. Enabling the 65 watt profile, however, has a strong impact on efficiency. Power consumption increases by about 20%, pushing past 100 watts in some tests and exceeding 80 degrees in the process, which, considering the inconsistent performance benefits, is probably another good reason not to use that mode. All things considered, this looks like a pretty strong package. The CPU is more powerful than my desktop Ryzen 7 5700X in most tasks, and it doesn't throttle anywhere near as far as I expected. The GPU can do the job for light gaming, even in demanding titles with settings turned down, though being a Radeon there are limitations in some apps regarding what it can accelerate, Blender being a key example, but I understand machine learning is another weak spot for AMD. There are other weak points. I received my CS7 with a clean install of Windows 11 and no bloatware beyond the kind Microsoft includes as standard. For an enthusiast or someone kitting out an entire business or institution, then this could actually be a blessing. But if you are hoping for some apps for controlling TDP etc, like the kind often found on devices like the Steam Deck and ROG Ally, you'll have to find your own. The BIOS is also unintuitive, being the same generic layout you'd have found in every PC 25 years ago, but lacking meaningful control like frequencies or RAM timings. The final thing to talk about, the price. The C7 is available in the same configuration on B-Link's UK site for £769, with a £110 discount voucher that can be applied up until the end of October. 
In the US, those prices are $729 before discount and $619 after, again with the $110 offer ending October 31st. Now, I usually review budget gaming builds, especially used ones, and while I don't hold the Seer 7 to the same standards as a full-size gaming tower, it's hard to deny that you could build a hell of a lot of gaming PC for £769 or even £659. A more likely competitor would be the Mac Mini, which currently starts at £649, but which offers much less for your money. That base model would only have a quarter of the RAM and SSD space, and matching the B-Link spec for spec would involve upgrading to the top model, which would set you back a ridiculous two grand. You can, of course, get cheaper mini PCs from B-Link and others, but from what I've seen, the only ones that get to hang out in the same performance class as the CS7 also have Ryzen 7000 series APUs. Thanks to B-Link for providing the review unit, they didn't pay me any money to say any of the nice things I've said, and they didn't try to dissuade me from being critical. There is a link below to the B-Link site if you want to buy one of these for yourself. It's not an affiliate link, it's just there for your convenience. If all sponsors are this chill, maybe I should do more sponsored content. Anyone want to hear about VPNs? No? Okay, fair enough. I, 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 I don't really want to talk about them either. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.